Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Sam. And on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Rosecrans Baldwin and Steph Cha discussing Rosecrans' new book, Everything Now, Lessons from the City State of Los Angeles. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list you'd like for our readers to answer, please click the like button and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with us and each other in the chat area to the right. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future and you can learn more about them by going to our website, signing up for our email newsletter. You can follow us on social media at BookSoup and you can follow us right here on our Crowdcast page to get direct notifications. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. And please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. They are signed copies and it'll redirect you. When you click the button, it'll redirect you to our website where you can complete the checkout process and it will not interrupt viewing. So you can do that at any time. And we're also open for in-store browsing. So if you're local to Los Angeles, please come by weekly or daily, sorry, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we would love to see you. And just another fun thing we're doing at Book Soup right now, we are on Pop Shop Live, which is a new kind of new app. Um, it's kind of like a store online. It's really convenient, actually, to buy books. And every other week we go live and discuss um, different themes. Today we talked about rock and roll books and bestsellers, which included Rosecrans books. So just wanted to shout that out and um, let you know that if you want to shop that way and engage with us and meet some of our promo team and booksellers, um, it's a free app and it's only on iPhones for right now, but it's fun and you can go throw some lightning bolts at us. It's kind of like Instagram live. And with all that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Rose Kranz Baldwin is the author of The Last Kid Left, You Lost Me There, and Paris, I Love You But You're Bringing Me Down. He is a frequent contributor to GQ and co-founded the online zine, The Morning News, and lives in Los Angeles. Steph Char, other guest tonight, is the author of Your House Will Pay, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the California Book Award, and the Juniper Song Crime Trilogy. She is a critic whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the LA Review of Books, where she served as noir editor and is the current series editor of the Best American Mystery and Suspense Anthology. A native of the San Fernando Valley, she lives in Los Angeles with her family. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Rose Crans and Steph. Thank you both so much for being with Book Soup tonight. And everyone, please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, so, uh, we were thinking maybe Rosecrans could start by uh, reading some from his extraordinary yes. book, Everything Now, which you can purchase. Uh, I'll keep plugging that every, uh, it meant, you know, this matches that green button, actually. You know, someone pointed out recently that it's the exact same green, like a Hollywood person pointed out it's the exact same green as a green screen. I don't know if we can do like special things with it. It's like, you know, like disappear. <laughs> I don't know really how that works, but yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, That's so, your face. <laughs> my face just, I think the idea is I'm going to read a short bit. Um, this is only about three or four pages long, and then we're going to dive into a conversation, right? And then after that, we'll take we'll do questions, and we'll see where it goes. Um, okay. Well, this um, so for anyone, uh, which is probably everyone who has not read this book, um, it is largely sort of about what it is like to live in Los Angeles and what it, Los Angeles is like broadly uh, through my experiences interviewing and discussing that with a ton of people in the year 2021 or 2020, or just let's say recently. Um, and it is uh, largely composed of ideas and thoughts and feelings and stories that other people shared with me. Uh, I'm very much not in the book. It's very much about me just sort of going around all of LA County and around Southern California in general, greater Los Angeles to sort of meet people uh, who represent or embody sort of different ideas or stories or narratives that are just part of LA right now. Uh, and so I'm gonna share a quick one. Uh, someone um, who appears in sort of a, 
a different identity in the book because they needed their name changed for various reasons. But for those who are familiar with Los Angeles literature, you will recognize their pseudonym or their name. In the book, they're referred to as Henry Chinaski. Uh, Henry Chinaski is actually uh, a name that um, was used by one of an, another, um, you know, one of the great, great uh, Los Angeles writers, Charles Bukowski, for his protagonist. So I borrowed it here to pay homage to him. But in this case, uh, I don't really have to set it up much more. This is just a horse gambler that I spent about 16 hours with drinking way too much beer because he wanted to teach me about the horse gambler's energy and what it says about what it's like to live in Los Angeles and why so many people are attracted to living in Los Angeles. Okay, that's a way too much of a pre setup. Here we go. Writing a book such as this about the city-state of Los Angeles and its humans and their wins and losses, eventually a person would be introduced to Henry Chinaski. What Chinaski had managed to do by his mid-40s, and only in the city-state of Los Angeles could he have achieved it, he thought, was to construct a life in which he made just enough money as an actor and lost just enough money as a gambler to be able to do exactly what he liked. And what he often liked to do several days a week was to go on a 14-hour marathon 10 a.m. until 2 in the morning, during which he'd run the bars in his little corner of the San Fernando Valley and play the ponies. By noon on a bright autumn Thursday, Chinaski had been gambling and drinking for about 90 minutes in a dark bar in North Hollywood, the small valley town that was about a 15-minute drive over the mountains from Hollywood proper. Chinaski had lived in the county for nearly two decades. In person, he had the broad-shouldered good looks of a former football player whom the universe had yet to strike with much grief. For 15 minutes, he'd been a horse... <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> For 15 years, he'd been a horseman, he said when we shook hands, and had gained something he called the horseman's mentality, which he promised to explain over the course of our day together. Horses are my kryptonite, he said while ordering us a pair of beers. I walk by a TV with the horse on it, I get the sweats. Uh, I'm just going to pause for one second and point out that I got to, I was lucky enough not to just write and publish this book, but also to record the audiobook for it. And when I did the next section, I wasn't uh, too aware of how it works. And I kind of might have permanently injured my audio, my recording engineer, because I just did this next part too loudly because I did a Chinaski impression. So I'm going to try it again. I'm not going to blow out your ears, but uh, here we go. <clears throat> a race was about to start. Chinaski picked up a newspaper and rolled it into a crop. His habit during races was to whack the bar like a jockey stoking his horse to a win. So here's the two horse, Chinaski narrated quietly after the gun went off. He's on the lead. That's where you want this horse to be. You see, he's getting a little heat on the outside. And whack went the crop. Now, we need this two horse to get out. Watch the jockey. Look under his right armpit. Then we know he's got horse and he's going to blast out. And whack, whack with the crop and his voice picked up volume. Come on, buddy, just look. Oh, don't let this four go with you. Come out on the four, whip on the left-hand side, come out on the four, whack, whack, whack. Four's already all in, Jesus, we're handwriting. We might be loaded, this four horse could be loaded. Oh man, I need a wire, whack, 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 whack. And here comes the three on the inside, two, three, get the exact up, but do not get the three win. Oh, son of a gun, do not let it stay up. Four, give me two, three, four. Rosecrans is a four leaf clover, whack. Whack, whack, whack. Two's a winner. Three's coming in second. Two, three, four, six. Oh my God, we did it. We hit the superfecta and everything. And then he just whacks the bar a ton of times. I'm not going to do that for you. Uh, I had no idea what happened, except the beers were empty. The crop was in tatters. And Chinaski was very glad to meet me, he said, while he ordered us another round. Remy Nadeau, and forgive me if I said that wrong, uh, in Los Angeles from Mission to Modern City wrote, Los Angeles is perennially refreshing itself with newcomers who have left behind them the pressures for conformity. The Chinaskis of Pittsburgh were a large, sturdy family of Catholic Czech Americans, Chinaski said, with roots somewhere outside of Prague. Chinaski, the youngest of six, much younger than the rest, had grown up babysitting his sister's children. A gambler since he was 13, a lifelong performer, he'd always dreamed big, but no one had encouraged his ambitions. No one thought he'd leave Pittsburgh, but they hadn't made room for him either. Anybody who's a little too loud, who doesn't want to give in, they reject you, he said. He moved to Los Angeles and found a place that had room for him. A sense of being spurned, though, still pissed him off. In Pittsburgh, you do anything out of the ordinary, you're viewed as weird. And if you get a little success, they root against you. And when you are successful, they're really nice to you. 
He didn't say really nice to you, but this is a family broadcast. I hate that. I want everybody to win. Whatever you're into, I'm into it. Gradually, Chinaski found his way into acting. Small parts in television and film, some national commercials. Around the bars and restaurants of the San Fernando Valley, specifically North Hollywood, where Chinaski lived and mostly stayed, he was known well enough to be greeted cheerfully by the dozen or so bartenders and hostesses we encountered. He knew their names, the names of the men on ballet, the number of children in a line cook's family. Oh, here we go, said one bartender loudly, an aspiring actress in her early 20s, who turned around as soon as she saw him and switched the television to the races. No one else ever watches horses, she said. We love them, though. For an hour, Chinaski placed small bets. He called them cups of coffee on several races, and he lost all of them, but that was routine, he said. As a working gambler, the most he'd ever won on a single bet was $64,000. The most in a single weekend in Las Vegas, $100,000. The most on the Kentucky Derby, $37,000. But mostly he lost, he said, smiling, then turned to the bartender and asked after her latest auditions. All day and night, Chinaski was solicitous and generous, always picking up tabs, happy go unlucky with strangers and friends. It made me think that probably the only thing better than being Chinaski in Chinaski's mind would be to be a more winning Chinaski, a version written as fast and as far as a Chinaski's pumping heart could take him. The biggest gamble of his life, he explained between races, was his acting career. He still had a dream to land something meaty, a regular role on a TV show, just some great lines and a great scene. In the meantime, he couldn't complain. People are like, you could have contributed to the world, he said. I couldn't. I'm limited. If I could be Elon Musk, I'd be Elon Musk. All I can do is be charming and open doors and get groceries for people, take people to the doctor. I'm good and I'm nice, but not at a life-changing level. I just know my limits. Suddenly, a gun went off. Another race. He'd already placed his bet. He stood up, yanked out his crop. Oh, we got horse. We got horse. Come on, five. We got horse. Come on out on the six. Come out on the six. You're going to gun me down, six. Six got us done. Shit. Six is like Falcor from the never-ending story. The race was over. Another loss. Shoot, Chinaski yelled again. He did not say shoot. And sat down angrily on his stool. I asked how much money he'd lost. He didn't answer, just drank his beer. That was a big bomber, he said quietly to himself. A moment later, he said from the corner of his mouth, what is the second best thing to gambling and winning? gambling and losing. I asked if that was the horseman's mentality. He didn't answer. A few minutes later, Chinaski checked his phone. Holy crap, he said quietly. He stood up. Holy crap. What is it? The bartender said. Chinaski looked at her, looked at his phone again, then stared out the door. His body went rigid. His eyes were suddenly glowing, as if the sun was in the center of his skull. I can't believe it, he whispered. What? I booked a part. You did? I booked a part. The bartender laughed. There you go, Chinaski. He read out an email to the entire bar. It was from his television agent. He booked a gig the following week, a speaking role on a new police show. It's two lines or whatever, he said, but just get me on set. Who knows what will happen? You're a charmer, the bartender reassured him. You're charming. If I crush one or two lines, then somebody might think, instead of casting Buffalo Bill or whatever, put in Chinaski. You got to believe that. Tough up or buck up, Chinaski, the bartender said, laughing, and put down two more beers. Thank you for listening to that. Oh, that was so good. I read this a while ago, and I I, I, I love that part. And I love there's there are just so many like sparkling characters who kind of come weave in and out of 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 this book. Um, I wanted to start though by asking you about the the starting point, um, the like kind of initial premise of Los Angeles as city state. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what got you thinking about that frame for this book and like, you know, what, what you think a city state is and like how well you think that Los Angeles ends yeah, up kind for of sure. fitting into that. Um, it really started when Rachel, my partner, my wife, uh, screenwriting partner, we moved to Los Angeles now it's about six and a half years ago. And two things happened to me very quickly. Um, one, which um, didn't make any sense at all. I felt like I was at home. Um, I'd never really had that feeling before. I grew up mostly in Connecticut, but kind of, I was born in Chicago, lived in Nashville for a little bit, Connecticut mostly, and then lived in a bunch of different places before ending up in Southern California. Um, and I don't have much family here. It's not like I have a strong connection to the place. So it was 
I mean, I say this very genuinely. I felt like I was home and I felt confused by that. Uh, two, um, I found Los Angeles within a week or two of being in Los Angeles, um, both uh, really confusing and really um, exciting. I think I loved it from the start and I think I was sort of driven a little bit, um, I don't know, just super confused. Like, right? I mean, I know you're from here, but I was just, um, I was a little bit flabbergasted by it. And uh, I think my response for whatever reason, perhaps by my job, for reasons of my career, or perhaps just I'm an innately curious person, I just started reading everything I could get a hand, get a hold of uh, about Los Angeles, whether it's history books or novels or poetry or stories. Um, and I think that shows up in this book. It's just became a real passion of mine for two or three or four years. And then the research phase of this book, um, to just learn as much as I could because there was so much that didn't make sense to me. And I don't say that uh, with anything more than just being like a, just a dum dum. Like I was like looking around, driving, you know, around in my car and being like, why is this neighborhood so different from this neighborhood? But they are next to each other. And why, when I'm driving around, does it feel like LA never ends? And why, yada, yada, yada. Anyone who's been in Los Angeles for the first time, I'm sure these are very common feelings. Um, but to answer your question, uh, there was an article that I'd seen in Forbes magazine in 2010. Um, and it made the argument that the concept of a city state might apply to more places than we might think of in the 21st century if we just updated the criteria for a bit, a bit, excuse me. So just really quickly, a city state, the idea is before the globe was carved up into countries, into nation states, which is really only about 400 years old. Before that, human civilization, you know, was a matter of empires and dynasties and going as far back as recorded history. Um, you go back to Mesopotamia, you, you see these units um, in Southeast Asia, in the African continent, in uh, all, all over the place of where you have a metropolis of some kind, as it applies to the period of the of when it existed. Um, you have a sovereign territory and you have people that are united by the use of its resources, whether it is a large river, and here we have Istanbul, whether it is uh, you know, parts of Mesopotamia, parts of wherever. Um, and people are bound together by trade, by the need to communicate through multiple languages, by perhaps certain customs or religion or a common feeling about certain rituals that have to do with educating your children or going about your life. In any case, that was considered sort of the one of the foundational ways that humans organize themselves. And so the city state has been around for a really long time. You know, it was fundamental to Italy prior to unification. It was fundamental to so many parts of different civilizations around the world. Uh, in any case, they made the argument, and I'm sorry, this is a long winded answer, but in this Forbes article, the author, author of it made the argument that if you updated it to be a little bit more contemporary, if you thought a little bit about money laundering, if you thought about aspirations to host the Olympics or the World Cup, if you thought about uh, whether or not you have fancy restaurants that serve alcohol or perhaps cannabis. In other words, these facets that sort of start to be, appear more contemporary than other places that are sort of these mega cities around the world might be city states. Uh, because the formal definition right now applies to Singapore, perhaps to Monaco, perhaps to Va the Vatican City, um, but there were certain places that might get a badge if they applied. And it just helped me. Um, you know, like, I think you and I have had this conversation before off camera because we've known each other for a little bit, but like, I'm not from here. I don't have any innate credibility to talk or write about Los Angeles or have ideas about Los Angeles. And I'm assuming that you, as someone who's from here, has had enough people from the East Coast or wherever showing up for a week and being like, hey, let me tell you about Los Angeles. Uh, and so I was like effing uh, scared of doing that. So, but this model, this metaphor of a city state helped me understand Los Angeles better. And it made it gave me a way in to begin sort of the investigation, which is what the book is really about. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I am curious, like uh, before you moved here, like did you have, um, did you have any kind of notion or sense of like what you were expecting Los Angeles to be? Like, did, what did you think about like our image to the rest of the world or the rest of the country? Because I know, I mean, especially coming from the East Coast, I mean, that's like, you know, you know, like the New York Times version of Los Angeles, like, like, <laughs> like, was, was your view of our city kind of like that? <laughs> I mean, the slander, 
<laughs> yeah, the uh, listen, that's a great question. Um, I'll tell you, this is kind of in the book, but this is super true. Um, before, so two places that we lived before Los Angeles, we lived in France, and then we moved to North Carolina uh, for about four years. In France, um, I used to stream, I think this was before it was a podcast, I used to stream KCRW, specifically Good Food with M. Kleiman, and back when Jonathan Gold, rest in peace, was sort of the weekly restaurant critic. Um, and this was before I think he'd won the Pulitzer, before the documentary, before. And I streamed it because I loved the chemistry in their conversations. I also love, obviously, the way that he talked about restaurants. I'm not a, you know, I like restaurants. Obviously, I love to go out to eat, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying obviously, but it's a nice thing. Um, in any case, the way that Goal and Kleiman together talked about exploring Los Angeles and specifically not just downtown, not just Beverly Hills, not, and for example, not even not just Koreatown or Boyle Heights or like, but there was just a sense of the, the vastness, the diversity, the breadth um, in those conversations. It just made me excited about it and not on a food level, but really on the, the idea of a place to explore. And I think, and Kleiman, you know, after um, Gold passed away, in an interview in the LA Times, I think it ran after his death, it might have run before, but she pointed out that a lot of people used Gold as a way to sort of uh, discover Los Angeles, whether they were from LA or had, or were, they were like me and just sort of showed up for whatever reason, uh, that his curiosity, his uh, willingness to sort of put himself into a place he perhaps wasn't comfortable. I'm not trying to speak more than I should, but I'm just saying like he made a big deal about going out and discovering and testing things out and being open to new experiences. And Los Angeles, when you uh, when you are willing to do that, gives you so much back. And so I think I certainly I'm sure I had cliches about Los Angeles that were informed by dumb articles or dumb movies or whatever, but I think I came here pretty open-minded because um, I, th I think I knew so little about it. And I mean, I came once as a kid to go to Disneyland and the the uh, tar pits. That was my only experience really of LA besides one work gig at one point before I moved here. Yeah, I think that's a, you know, I end up liking the people who come to LA with that kind of Jonathan Gold mentality um, because I think, uh, yeah, I think people, it's a hard city to visit in a lot of ways because you try to do too much in like a single weekend. I mean, if you try to go to the Santa Monica Pier and Disneyland in a weekend, you're not going to have a good time like on that trip. You're just not. You're better off like hanging out with like somebody you know and like not being too ambitious and making multiple trips, you know. Um, but uh, I, 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 you know, I like that you brought up Jonathan because, you know, he's a personal hero of mine. I love him. Um, but he's also somebody who, you know, he made a career out of, even though he was an LA native, he kind of approached these places as a visitor. You know, he would go into these immigrant communities, you know, he kind of made his bones by like eating on every restaurant on Pico Boulevard in this kind of spirit yep. of exploration. And he's somebody who, you know, did this thing as like a white dude that like, you know, I think like, people would be like, oh, like you can't get away with that. But like every single person loves him, you know, probably most of all people from those communities that he visited. And, you know, I kind of wanted to ask you about that, you know, that kind of um, the deference of an outsider, like how you how you kind of manage that while also kind of really going in, um, you know, on the city and like kind of exploring all its different facets. I mean, obviously there's kind of the openness, but like, what was that? What was that like? Kind of navigating both the interview process and the writing process um, as somebody who's not from here and who like knows that if you like trip up, you're gonna get emails. <laughs> That's true, or tweets, or uh, calls, yeah. or text, uh, or or just yeah, full bore yeah. canceling. <laughs> you know, it's um, I certainly felt anxiety around it. Um, first of all, there's the anxiety of influence, as you know, some might call it, and that is to say. Los Angeles doesn't lack for literature. Los Angeles doesn't lack for self-understanding. Also, Los Angeles, not only is it enormous, but it is enormously resplendent with the vastness of the global population. You know, every nation, every culture, 
nearly, let's say, is in Los Angeles and in big numbers. Um, the idea also that if like you just sort of follow the English language version of Los Angeles that you're getting all of it is insane. Um, so in going about things, I think first of all, I was just really anxious to make sure that I read as much as I could of what other people had said about LA. And that's everything from Mike Davis and Linnell George and Walter Mosley to Hector Tobar and Steph Cha and but like so many people who are either from LA or have came here as transplants, you know, um, Carrie McWilliams, the Island on the Land book uh, was just when I read that because it's such a page turner for a history. Um, I was just really, uh, you know, the, the the window in the mind opens a little bit, and every author it seems like I kept encountering, and that's what the book. Hopefully, there's so many. The reason I reference so many and quote so many authors in the book is because it was really my sort of path of learning to mm -hmm. getting to know certain sides of LA, and we, again, only certain, only aspects of it. I only, you know, I only speak French and English, so and my Spanish is terrible. In any case. Um, in going about it, you know, I just, once I started the interviewing process, it was really coming up with a list of dozens of people that I was just interested in talking to. And, you know, and for many good reasons, a lot of people didn't want to talk to me. Uh, and then and that's fine. And maybe I pester them a little bit, maybe it leads to something, or maybe it doesn't. And then I start talking to people. And also some people, you know, I would just, we had a lot of conversations that had nothing to do with the book and didn't end up in the book. And there are a lot of people I interviewed that like, for the book, and that that didn't end up in the book either, um, and that's just the way it works. You know, I'm not. Um, I don't think. I hopefully, don't give off a pressure vibe. Like it was never like a lot of this was really like just an education and a really valuable one, and I really prized people's time. But once people were sort of willing to go along with the idea that I was working on this book, I mean, okay, here's the other thing. Like no one cares about a book. You know, it's like, it's like, if That's you're true. writing like, oh, listen, I'm on deadline, <laughs> this is going to be in the newspaper next week and there's going to be a photo, then people are like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll turn out for that. But if you're like, I'm working on a book that may be published and it may be published several years from now, it's such a joke, you know, it's just <laughs> like, okay, well, now that there are no <laughs> expectations set, you know, and, and honestly, it yields some wonderful conversations and those conversations keep going. And that's the nice thing is I was able to work on this book for about, I don't know, three or four years. And so I really developed relationships with people and people really uh, honestly trusted me with stories and trusted me um, with just, uh, I guess, a certain confidence. Uh, and I mean that they were confiding in me. Um, and that's, so there were frustrations. There was a lot of stuff that didn't end up in the book, but I'm, um, I feel very grateful um, for the stuff people did share with me. And then <laughs> frankly, like went through the fact checking process and everything with me a lot, you know, till, till now. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pause just to say, um, if people have questions, you can ask them in the ask a question box because, um, we'll take them at the end, but we're not going to like, you know, there's no like audience that I can call on. Um, but I will, I will look if you, if you ask questions in that, uh, ask a question box. Um, so yeah, actually, so Rosecrans and I, uh, you know, we had met like once before we did our reading together, but I don't think we really talked. And then I did tournament of, I, I did tournament of books. Uh, I judged tournament of books one year. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of corresponded over that, but we really became friends after you emailed me for this book. Yeah. Um, cause you, you just, and I think what I remember is you emailed me and I think you like bought me drinks and we're just like, Tell, like let's talk and then you and then at the end I gave you like a list of you know other people that you might be interested in talking to so very yeah. like you know my brother was like a sociology major I feel like this is like classic sociology you know just kind of networking you know yeah, kind of yeah, following, yeah. following the trail of people to talk to um and you know I think it's interesting too that like you started doing this you know pretty shortly after you moved to LA and so actually the writing of the book and the creating the creation of relationships, um, you know, kind of incidental to your research in a way, um, you know, that must be like a large part of like your experience of living in this city. Can can you talk about that? Like how, um, you know, how, like how entwined this project became with like your social life? You know, are you keeping up with a lot of people that you, <laughs> you know, like was this it's just true. a way to get to know people? Was this just a way to like make friends as an adult <laughs> in the city? Because that's, maybe everyone should do that. I, I, listen, it's, um, I highly recommend it. I met 
awesome people like Steph Cha and many others. Uh, that's hilarious. I had never thought of it that way, and now I have to rethink a lot of things. I'm going to be up all night. Um, okay, <laughs> great question. And I also, interestingly, like our conversation, the interview, it just didn't end up in the book. There was a like I feel like almost half the interviews I did didn't end up in the book, and that was just it. Just wasn't sort of where the book went for whatever reasons. Um, huh. Yes. Did I use it to meet people? I don't know. I got to meet some incredible people. I mean, people who's like work, for example, about Los Angeles, uh, Davis, George, um, TJ yeah. Waldy, um, you know, there's numerous, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry that on the top of my head, I can name more, but like people uh, were so generous with their time and would be willing to talk to me about it. Um, it definitely, how did it influence my experience of LA over the past couple of years? It's been wonderful. This has been uh, probably the most fun I've had working on a book. You know, um, novels are a different animal, as you know. It's um, it's very private. It is um, very very difficult. It is uh, I find it very discouraging. It's a weird thing about like you start a new novel and you realize you don't remember anything that you learned the last time you wrote a novel, oh, and you're yeah, just yeah. it's like ground. You know, it's you start all over again, and it's just the worst. Um, and then you go grocery shopping and then you figure something out about a character. But, you know, with nonfiction, I don't know. At some level, this felt like playing in a band. You know, it felt collaborative. It felt, um, again, I just come back to people were just so, but it, also this is kind of infuriating. Um, I would, so in, during lockdown, you know, um, we were in our apartment and I was editing the book and, I started still like needing to, I'm a, you know, I'm a sort of a people person. I really enjoy meeting new people and asking people questions and stuff like that. And so for example, I was volunteering on Saturdays at Dodger stadium at the uh, first, the testing site and the vaccination site. And I was meeting all kinds of new people about that. And I was like, Oh, this, you would be great in the book for this, but it's too late. I'm already, <laughs> shoot. Yeah. or I would, uh, you know, I'd meet someone through some other means. So there's like, in, in, to some degree, you know, it's a fairly, Hi, I'm going to please my publicist right now and show you the cover again. Um, it's a fairly slender book, and it was much longer at one point, and I just sort of kept trying to sharpen it and sharpen it and make just a very tight little argument. Um, but it's, you know, it's 252 pages. It could have been 500 based on earlier drafts. And I still am meeting people because... LA doesn't lack for characters. LA doesn't lack for extraordinary people, you know, living out something that is just an interesting story. There's so many stories lying around LA. I don't, to be a journalist, to be a writer in LA, uh, it is a gold mine. Um, and so I could update, I could refresh this book. I could enlarge this book for the rest of my life. You know, as long as I live in Los Angeles, I feel like I could just keep doing it. Uh, so yeah, here's the advice kids. If you want a very active social life, write a book, <laughs> nonfiction, nonfiction. Yeah, not fiction. Um, I, I, uh, I, 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 I am blanking on the question I was just about to ask you. Um, but you uh, ask me if I'm going to get a Basset Hound because you have a collection <laughs> of Basset Hounds. Not everyone knows this about yeah. Steph Shaw, crime novelist, literary fiction novelist, book critic, but she has a collection of Basset Hounds. Yeah, Basset and Basset Hound art. Um, yeah, so, so you were <laughs> You were talking about um, writing r writing novels too, you know, and uh, and I read the last kid left. I I, I, I thought it was great, um, and um, yeah, it is like a very different muscle. Um, and and what's what's your breakdown now? You have two of each. I have two fiction. novels and two nonfiction books. Yeah. Um, you know, do you like to kind of alternate between them? Do you, or do, are you feeling nonfiction more right now? Uh, I you know it's a great. Um... I'm dying to work on fiction right now. So maybe I do like to alternate. My, maybe my mind likes that. Um, nonfiction in certain ways is you get to rely on help. You get to talk to other people. You get to interview. You get to use research tools. Uh, and obviously fiction can use all those tools also. And I, hopefully one improves the other, you know. Um, but uh, the dramatization, the sort of interior investigation, the way that you can pull things out of your childhood and, you know, shove them into the mind of somebody else, which now sounds very violent that I think about it. But uh, yeah, fiction is also, it just, you know, I don't know about you. Actually, here's a question for you. It's writing is hard enough. 
if it's not fun to some degree, um, I'm not sure that I would be able to keep with it. And so fiction and nonfiction both have different elements of fun. Do you feel that way? I do. I mean, I do a lot more like, uh, I, you know, I do freelance nonfiction stuff, but that's really just like profiles and book reviews and stuff like that. You know, the occasional essay. I don't think I have like a full nonfiction project in me. The like level of research that's required. I'm just not, I don't know. I'm too lazy. Um, you also, you also screenwrite and, uh, and, you know, so that's another kind of form of writing that you, that, um, well, that's also very much part of your livelihood. Um, and there's part of this book is dedicated to Hollywood, the right amount, I would say, you know, if like weird as that is, you know, there's, yeah. cause, cause I think like people who are like native to LA get very defensive about the like outsized part that Hollywood plays in our yeah, for good global reason. image. Yeah. Um, but it is like one in 40 people like work in the industry. It does come up a lot. It is a big part of like our economy and correctly to an extent our image. Um, can you talk about like writing about Hollywood, you know, as somebody who's like, kind of like you're like an insider, but you just got here and like kind of incorporating it into this larger project? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, truthfully, I didn't want to write about Hollywood at all. Mm -hmm. um, there were there were two things. Um, I'll just be super honest about this. There were two things I was reluctant to write about. One is Hollywood, and one is homelessness. Um, the reason being that an enormous amount has been written about both things. Two, there are an enormous amount of experts on both things. Um, and I'm not an expert nor enormously knowledgeable on either of them. I just have my own experiences. Um, in terms of, um, and I will, let me address homelessness first and then I'll go to Hollywood. Uh, in terms of homelessness, it would be a strange book about Los Angeles today that didn't address homelessness. Um, the problem, the people, uh, the individuals, the suffering, uh, where it came from and racism's component in homelessness, um, the daily grind for everybody in Los Angeles, except for people who are locked behind their gates in Bel Air or, or something like that. And frankly, I mean, there's a conversation I had in the book that you'll get, if people who read the book will get to this with Gavin De Becker, who is a great security expert, really interesting, born and raised in Los Angeles in very difficult circumstances. And he made the point that, you know, there's a lot of people in Los Angeles who don't see homelessness at all, you know, and now, you know, people complain about like their drive to their private jet, they have to go buy some tent campus. And so they're gonna move to Arizona and those people can just go, we, we know what those people can go do. In any case, um, there are, so the reason I brought up people who hide from it, because those are frankly the people that I'm scared of, because those are the people when they start to feel their interests being attacked are gonna find ways to defend themselves. Um, and I feel, fear them a lot more than I do someone who's in an encampment down the block from where I live in Hollywood. In any case, uh, wow, I really went on a soapbox. That's what a book is for. This is just a very pleasant <laughs> chat. Uh, so with regards to homelessness, you can't talk about Los Angeles right now without talking about homelessness. Um, Hollywood, I thought I could write about Los Angeles without writing about Hollywood. And uh, my editor, who's very, very smart and is also from Southern California, uh, made the point that, listen, it would be silly not to write about Los Angeles. Let's just find ways to write, excuse me, not to write about Hollywood. Let's just find ways to write about Hollywood that perhaps are an update to the cliches, or at least perhaps there are some perspectives that people haven't seen. Um, and so, you know, there is a cliche about, you know, the waitress on Sunset Boulevard waiting to be discovered. And so I went and uh, was lucky enough to sort of be introduced to this very young actor uh, named Jen Tullock, also a writer um, who I just really got luck of the draw. I sh sort of shadowed her for about a year or so, just lots and lots of interviews. and. Uh, she had a uh, film that she uh, co-wrote with a terrific uh, writer, actor, director named Hannah Ut. They created it together and it ended up going to Sundance. And I was just lucky enough that it got accepted at Sundance and was able to go to Sundance and experience that with them. But um, it's so weird because people in Hollywood business, in movie, TV, whatever, um, they talk about LA as if everybody works in Hollywood and everybody else in LA, which is 99.1% of people or whatever, are kind of like, 
my experience of Hollywood is when I go to the movies, if I do that, you know? And so it's, I wanted to sort of be in touch with that uh, side of it also, and hopefully represent, you know, that um, there are aspects of the Hollywood dream. The reason that young writers, directors, old writers, directors, actors, whatever, come to Los Angeles looking for that dream that also thematically really show up in why a lot of people come to Los Angeles in the first place, whether that is for a break, for wealth, for recognition, to be famous, uh, to escape sort of the conformity of their small town or their big town that they grew up in somewhere else. And LA was the place for them. Um, the aspirations of people who come here just for Hollywood, I think are connected to that. And I think it says something about, um, particularly the transplants of why people wind up in greater Los Angeles. Yeah, and you know, and, I, and you live in Hollywood and actually it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned Hollywood and homelessness as these kind of two things that you were reluctant to touch because, you know, those are both things that are like right outside your doorstep, you yeah. know? And, and I think that it's hard to ignore either of them because they're so, it, intertwined with um you know even our self you know like our image of ours our image of our city um yeah. for what it's worth um i really thought the uh the way that you wrote about homelessness um was like it, 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 i don't know i feel like i've read a lot about homelessness too and um i mean you wrote about it in the way that was very like this is like i hate this i, I think like you said i hate this yeah um and, you know, I mean, something about that, like, really spoke to me, like, that, like, I, like, I remember that part, you know, months after I read the book, and, and though, you know, kind of the, the, um, the hate of the situation that, um, that, like, these people are in because of, you know, poverty and, and, you know, and illness and, and, uh, you know, kind of coupling that with, like, a deep, like, sympathy for them, um, I thought was, like, very well conveyed. Um, and, and actually, I did remember what I was going to ask earlier, which what was that, um, you know, you were drafting this book in kind of a different time. You know, that's kind of that's kind of the issue with like this long publishing cycle. Like, you know, you finish a yeah. book, you, you finish a book, you get to the editing stages and then like the world kind of turns into something else entirely. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think like you're getting the extreme version of that. Um, uh, but I guess you had some warning too you know it must have been at the end stages of drafting or the beginning stages of editing that you kind of that yeah. we entered into lockdown um yeah. and you know i i actually like haven't start i'm about to start writing another novel like and it's like and like you said it seems like i don't know how to do it anymore wait is this um, a juniper song novel or is this something else no i, I okay. it's it's nothing it's nothing it's like it's like the i should write a novel that's Ooh, the, I like that. yeah. <laughs> um but, you know, one of the things I told myself during pandemic when I was there, I mean, during lockdown, we're still in the pandemic, when I was like home with the baby and like couldn't work was like, well, you know, like I write about LA, you know, the world outside my house. Um, and like, who knows what that's going to look like when we get through the other side. So I was like, okay, I don't like have to be writing now because like, maybe it's not even going to be right. You know, and I wanted to ask like, uh, what, like how how has this last year kind of shaped your view of LA? You know, do you do you feel um, optimistic about where we're going? Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I I know I I, I hear what you're asking. Um, so yeah, the book was in editing when lockdown started, um, and in that way i was actually really lucky because i had done all the there was a lot of sort of you know shoe leather reporting required for the book and i still had a bunch of recording reporting still to do and a lot of research but it was thankfully all stuff i could do over the phone and it was stuff i could just order books you know through bookstores and get them in and um and so thankfully i was really lucky in that way um i one of the things that i saw and i i don't People will disagree with me about this, but in my personal experience, I feel this was true. I saw a lot of benevolence during lockdown in Los Angeles. And I honestly feel that's a trait to LA. I feel that there is something about the way that we are so diverse, that there are so many different populations. Um, there's a guy I interview in the book named Kit Rackless, who's a magazine editor of longstanding in Los Angeles and publisher, um, who talks about how it is not common around the world that this variety of communities and peoples can generally live together harmoniously so close side by side 
Um, and LA has that. And it, it has that uniquely versus other cities. Um, and what I have seen, whether it's because of the ways that we have to cooperate on the freeway or the ways that we have to cooperate in common spaces, or just how evident it is when going around LA to see people suffering, or also, frankly, people's success, because LA is certainly a town of flaunting. Um, whatever reason, we are perhaps a little bit hard shelled, but also thin skinned. And I honestly believe that that combination leads to a certain tolerance or a certain kindness towards others, even if it comes across gruffly. Um, and that is different from my experiences living in New York and Paris and Cape Town uh, and Chicago and just visiting other cities. In any case, um, I do think there is a genuine, and it's not, maybe it's woo woo and maybe it's hippy dippy and maybe it's because we're so blazed by 323 degrees days of sunshine. But uh, what I saw during lockdown was Los Angelinos Los Angelinos, who says that? Anyway, people in it here uh, being generous and kind to one another, even if it was just by virtue of doing their jobs or being out and about or they're volunteering or whatever. Um, so am I optimistic? I'm always optimistic. I am an optimistic person. Am I scared that the Olympics are gonna show up and suddenly we are taking things we find not cute and hiding them or punishing them or doing terrible things? Yeah, absolutely. Politicians are incentivized to do that. And so are rich people and so are whatever. So am I scared? Sure. Am I optimistic? Absolutely. Um, kind of, that's uh, not a, that wasn't a great answer, but yeah. That's no, it how is. It's, it's, it's everything at the same time. Which is, <laughs> you know, everything now. No, I mean, that's, I, I feel like this, you know, burr, burr. No, this title, I, I feel like ever since I like read your book and I, I've had this title in my head, you know, uh, I like, I, I, I think I told Rachel about this. I like wrote a piece. It was Rachel's Rachel. idea. I did not come up with the title. Oh, Rachel okay. came up with the title. This is, I'm, I'm very lucky to have the smartest wife in the world. It's such a perfect title. I mean, it's, it's kind of gotten in my head as a way that I think about LA, you know, like everything now, it's just that kind of layering. There's actually, uh, and, 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 you know, I wanted to point out too, like, even just like the format of this book, it just like, it looks like the way a book about LA should look, you know? It's like there are these kind of clusters of concepts and, you know, just- That is uh, super generous. You are the, like, you are the uh, student. I guess I will, there's actually, I'm gonna go to audience questions oh, yeah, now, like, and there's a question that kind of flows from it's that. 6.48, but, uh, we've got like 12 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is this one's from Adam. Is the simultaneous, not chronological model of history you talk about in the book something that LA is exporting to Californian or American identity in general? Great question. Thinking, I don't know. It's a great question. So I th if I understand the, re the question correctly, it is the idea that in Los Angeles, history can sometimes feel um, that the past, the present, and the future can feel simultaneous, which is something I sort of tease out in the book, an idea that I sort of bat around. The idea that history is constantly happening in LA and it is not a distant notion. It is not like when you're in New York or Boston or Philadelphia and everything feels sort of baked in and very hardened and that LA is sort of ultra present. Uh, is that being exported to the rest of the United States? From LA, I don't know, from the internet, from social media and the web, uh, you know, there's a uh, guy named uh, Dan Keat, uh, oh, shoot, I hate being on the spot. Um, what is Dan's last name? Gutierrez, uh, physicist, rocket scientist, also an am a professional, basically, stair climber uh, that I spent a day climbing stairs with around Los Angeles. Uh, and he made the point that perhaps LA was a city state. He kind of went with my idea, but he thought if it was one, it was one that sort of simulated the internet, that the way that sort of social media can sort of have an infinite scroll often feels when you're on one of LA's big avenues or streets, where it's just the endless, you know, corner strip malls uh, and auto shops and apartment buildings, et cetera. And there's lots of other things that he goes into. It's in the book, but um, so is LA doing it? Is the internet doing it? Are we all gonna move on to the internet very soon? All of these things are possible. Um, 
this question is from Miriam Lubet. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Hi, Miriam. Um, I'm mispronouncing your name too. Did you find differences in the stories of people who moved to LA versus people born in LA? And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tie in also Ali S's question, which is as a non-Spanish speaker, how did you access Latino LA? Okay, uh, let me do that one first. So, uh, with a shoot ton of um, <laughs> humility. <laughs> It was uh, honestly, this book is, um, it's both in research and interviews, um, a web of introductions. And what I mean by that is that in research, often the best things to read are what other authors who have done terrific stuff cite as footnotes and then find, and then track the footnotes down and then you get to the source and then follow their footnotes. And then you find books and articles and stuff that like no one's talking about and you get this amazing information in terms of people it was often just getting introduced to a person who would say who you would meet and have coffee and they didn't hate you enough that they wouldn't at the end of it be like well you should maybe talk to this person and so then you keep finding your way uh did i i did not spend that many t much time though with anyone i never used an interpreter because again i don't my spanish is garbage like I, I wish i've taken spanish lessons it didn't go anywhere i have like perma french stuck in my head um so it was often uh, just a means of introductions. Um, there was one moment where I, there were a couple of moments actually where I needed interpreters and it just, we sort of found our way to a certain understanding. And then they did not get used as interviews in the book because it just wasn't right. Um, in terms of, uh, Steph, help me, what was the first question? Uh, we had both these sort of this. Uh, it Latino, it Latino. was, uh, did you find differences in the stories of people who moved to LA versus people born here? Yes, and the answer is for sure. Uh, obviously, listen, LA County in itself is what, 11 million people, greater Los Angeles is 20 million people, huge diversity of stories, uh, very difficult to sort of try and group one versus the other. Uh, the transplants I found were more often, I'm just thinking about this very fast, so you know, give me a break on this one, but generalizing, the transplants were often running up a very quickly against ideas they'd had about LA soon after they moved here. In other words, they came to LA with certain expectations. The, LA didn't meet those expectations and they were blaming it on Los Angeles. Uh, not blaming it, but let's just say so enough people seem to be uh, not noticing that the expectations had been set by themselves or by others and not necessarily the city of or the place of Los Angeles. Uh, in terms of people who are from here, um, one thing that came up quite a bit was, uh, this is, I, I thought it was great. There was a generosity of understanding of people from LA, in my experience, understand that their experience of LA is, uh, I don't, small is not the right word, but they understand that they are a piece, that their experience of LA is a piece of LA. Uh, and they have a certain, it's not humility, but a, a, an understanding that their LA doesn't need to represent all of LA. It's just, they grew up here. They had, they grew up by the 405, you know, they grew up in Azusa, they grew up in wherever, like, and they don't need it to stand in for anything else because that's their experience. In the same way, like, I know this book is marketed in a certain way, but I wasn't looking to take a shovel or a bag. I wasn't looking to take a bag and like scoop up LA and be like, this is LA. And I know obviously I'm making this argument that it's a city state and I believe that, but it's again, it's my, idea and it made sense for me and it helped me understand LA. I'm not I'm not trying to explain LA even if it seems that way. I'm trying to understand LA and I hope those two things are different. Yeah, you know what it feels like to me is like a kind of it's a it's a very uh it, it's a sampling of yeah. you know the people who live here rather than a, here's everybody here's everything because you can't do that that's actually impossible you know and yet the title is everything now <laughs> a sampling of everything now <laughs> it doesn't have quite the same ring to it you know i i, I feel like i see a lot of people who um who kind of like hate on la and shallowness all these kind of characteristics they impose on la and it always kind of you know, it's such a, there's so many people here and like, there are so many options and like, how do you live, how you live your life that like, I think it always comes down to like, oh, you don't like the mirror. You don't like, yeah. you don't like seeing yourself and people like you, you know, because that's who you're choosing to associate with. So if like, you hate your experience of LA, like you chose that experience. <laughs>
I think, I think that's exactly right. I think that's I think that's totally true. And this is, it, you know, this is, I've I've said this in a bunch of these talks, but it, I keep saying it because it really rings true for me. There is a guy named Sam Sweet who is an he's a historian of LA, um, and he has a terrific series of independent books that he's published called All Night Menu. I highly recommend googling All Night Menu Sam Sweet. Order all of them. They're these self-published or pamphlet slash books um, about different addresses around Los Angeles and what makes them interesting and special. Um, in any case, he made the point to me that LA doesn't give a lot if you don't ask for it. That, and I made this, I made a joke about it in the newspaper, I think with uh, David Kippen, but I sort of said like, Los Angeles is not a hostess in a restaurant, you know? Like Los Angeles ask, needs you to be the one who's asking Los Angeles to the prom. And I made this joke, <laughs> no one wants to be asked, like everyone wants to be asked to the prom. No one wants to have to like, you know, reach out and ask someone else to the prom. But if you ask, this is a terrible metaphor. If you ask Los Angeles to the prom, Los Angeles says yes, and starts to give back. Like when you per pursue Los Angeles, when you begin to sort of go beneath the service and explore the towns and the communities and get in your car or whatever and get around, there is so much here. You know, there are so much interesting things and interesting people here. Uh, I mean, that's why, like you said this, Steph, but like, I don't, I don't want to live anywhere else, you know? Uh, why would I? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine living anywhere else. Also, I'm Korean, so why would I ever leave this place? Um, <laughs> uh, let's do this one quickly. It's a recommendation. Yeah, this request, last uh, question. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I want to do this one really quick and there's one more. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so um, someone, uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm Gotam Kalva, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name and I would ask you if you were on screen, but um, asked uh, asked uh, if we had any recommendations for absurdist humor in like any medium. Do you, anything that come immediately to mind? Uh, absurdist humor, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, to this person whose name I don't know, um, I apologize. I am terrible on on the spot Rex. Um, so <laughs> this person, if this person uh, goes to my website, rosecransbaldwin.com, there's a contact form, email me. I will email you back in the next couple of days and I will try to give you the best of absurdist humor, which I guess is, it's not really a category I know very well, but I will try to send you something good. Uh, but on the spot, no idea. Yeah, I don't know this. I don't know this uh, genre very well either. Um, for some reason, I keep thinking of Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. I don't know if that even counts. It's like pretty grim. Um, sure, okay. But uh, I like, I, I don't know. It's certainly absurdist. I'll tell uh, you, let me jump on that for a second, just as a humor thing, because this book is not funny. I think a lot of people call it funny. Maybe in, for them, maybe it is. But there's an unrecognized for being an LA great book, which is The Sellout by Paul Beatty. Uh, now, The Sellout, yes. people got, it won the Booker Prize. It, there's another big prize it won, like the National Books Critics Circle Award, yeah. or something like that. But it's not recognized as an LA book. And it's a very, very LA book. And it's a very, very like truth talking. I know people categorize it as humor or satire or as funny. I didn't laugh once when I read it, but that book is both absurd. It's very absurd, actually. Oh, awesome. Here's my recommendation, The Sellout by Paul Beatty. If you haven't read it, it's not funny. It's barely humorous at all, but it is certainly like profound and interesting and strange, and it's all about Los Angeles. I, I love the prologue, which hmm. is just like, the prologue is like a perfect piece of writing. I, I love that book. Um, also, White Boy Shuffle, actually. Which yeah, 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 fun. for sure. Um, okay, so last question. Um, what indicated that LA was home to you versus other places? This is from Book Soup. Thanks, Book Soup, for giving me the question that I'm struggling to answer. Um, <laughs> let's see. All props to Big Book Soup, wonderful bookstore. This is Rosecrans filling time while he tries to think of an answer. Dude, I don't know. Um, it was an emotion. Where do emotions come from? Childhood trauma. I don't know. Uh, things you can say on Zoom when you're not in front of a live audience of actual people. Uh, I would say, I, okay, here's actually, this is super honest, this is true. I was driving, I was stuck in traffic on the 101, classic LA experience. Uh, you know, and the 101 is just super dirty and grimy and there's like, you know, trash bags all around either side of the street or the, excuse me, the freeway. And I had my window down and it smelled like flowers. 
And I don't know what it is, but I loved that contrast. I remember that moment really standing out. And I don't know, if, I don't think that's necessarily like a typical LA moment, but something about the grittiness of Los Angeles, the, uh, the compactness, all these people inside of their cars, but smashed up against one another and going nowhere. And then it looks just really industrial and blindingly lit and then you open the window and it smells like flowers and you're like what is going on there's <laughs> something about the absurdity of that the absurd humor look at this let's bring it around that just really rang a bell for me so i don't know i'm a weirdo it worked for me well i'm uh, glad that you're here to stay i'm glad that you wrote this book once again the book is everything now uh you can you can mash that uh purchase button um you can apparently buy a signed copy uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this has been great. Rosecrans, congratulations on this book. Thank you so much, Steph. Thank you, Book Soup. And thank you to everybody who is listening and watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you for that poetic answer to my question, because I've lived in a lot of places and I was genuinely curious. So <laughs> I love that moment. I hope you write about that sometime if you haven't already. Yeah. Um, thank you both so much. And everyone, after you click that green button, thank you for joining us. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your night.